Thank you very much, Darren. Thank you very much, Johnny, for enabling me to come here. And um, at this, uh, in um, accepting the generosity of being offered this stage here, I'd like to uh, say that it was my good fortune to come to be able to come to Birmingham and to Biad for a very special occasion. And that was the uh, Viva for Daniel Rubenstein, one of our presenters. And I think we should start the day with a congratulations, Dr. Daniel Rubenstein. Yay. Daniel gave a, a wonderful and spirited account yesterday, and I wish you had all been there. So I'm just starting with a photo. And I've called my paper The Athleticism of Imaging, Figuring a Materials Performativity. And like Daniel, my work is about art beyond representation, and I'm arguing, I guess, photography beyond representation. Now, this particular image was always so important to me in, in pointing that out, because that little red dot, what does it do to you? You go, ouch, just that little red dot that sits there, that actually undoes representation because all you feel is the sizzle uh, on your tongue. And this is an image that I've taken with me for a long time. So, so that's kind of a, uh, that's just a taste of where I want to go. So I want to proceed, uh, I want to proceed, I've got to remind, remember this. Uh, this paper proceeds in, uh, will be staged in three movements. Firstly, I will chart an encounter with uh, the artist Benjamin Wood's action improvisations and his photo drawings to argue that images are bodies in fields of force. Secondly, I will return to the Bauhaus of the early 20th century to consider how Johann Itten's teachings in his basic course on design and form allows us to understand how we may live an image, which may be a strange, seem a strange place to go, but for me it's a very important place. Finally, I would address and reposition Stanley Cavell's concept of automatism and posit photography as a material discursive automat that is not a, represent, that is not a representational assemblage, but one that can undo representation and create something imaginable, yet pre precisely true to life. So I want to start with um, one of my students from VCA, Benjamin Wood, who's a sculptor. So Ben Wood, Wood is a sculptor whose improvisational practice engages with other people, with instruments that he makes, and specific circumstances and contexts. In this work, his aim is to respond to what the instruments will allow. Through what he calls tactful participation, his aim is to actualise new possibilities for specific physical arrangements, concepts and entanglements of bodies, instruments and the world. Wood sees his improvisations as ways of becoming aware of the dynamic interplay between humans and between humans and non-human actants. Of this approach, Woods comments that working with action as the redistribution of relations provides a platform for a process of opening or a physicality of openness. I work to make visible an, an, an agential reality where action is that which forms relations that matter. That's a quote from him. In developing his action, action improvisation, Woods began with what began to work with a camera to document his actions. So he initially he was doing actions and then to document, his, he, he uh, enlisted as his co-actor uh, a photograph. In responding to these documents, he soon came to recognise that the documentation images produced from these improvisations were not representational images for indexing of action in a linear sequence, but were actions in themselves. These documents became instruments in the making of photo drawings. Ben describes the, pro describes the process of, of picturing in the following way. He says, I remain seated in a chair, usually at night time, my fingers cutting with a computer touchpad. 
It can be seen that even in my relative calmness and rest, I am always being repositioned as a body in fields of force. Even though this process becomes akin to the pendulum in that it constitutes mark making, its marks become strange to past actions. As a result, my picture making, like instrument making, also aims to advance and propose the non-determinacy of action and the dispersive sensorial combination of materials and bodies that it involves, revealing forces that make and remake planes of composition. Affected, or should I say infected, by the drawings of El Lissitzky and the photo montages of, of Hannah Hock, Wood sees his picturing as a process, so, so he sees his picturing as a process with its own kind of action, a propellant radically opening futures for the becoming of the world. And I think that going to El Lissitzky is a, just a wonderful thing for, for somebody to do and also for Hannah Hock. So these people were the two kind of people who infected his uh, photo drawings. The claim that pictures are specific sets of dynamical, dynamic physical arrangements with their own force, which is a propellant of radically open futures, returns us, returns us to the question that I would see as central to this paper. How does one create something imaginable, yet precisely true to life, through picturing? This is not to invoke that through its mimetic functions, photography gives us something true to life, but rather to posit that despite its mimetic and representational character, photography is an expansive force that undoes representation and creates something unimaginable, yet precisely true to life. How do we go beyond the figure to the abstract framework that holds it together and us with it? In What is Philosophy, Deleuze and Guattari that art's role is to confront chaos, throw a net over it and create a plane of composition. This is a powerful image, one that may res resonate with our own struggles to make images. However, Deleuze and Guattari's conception of an aesthetic plane of composition should not be confused with technical composition, the relation between content and form. Rather, it is figured as the productive synthesis of forces constructed as a block of sensation. In creating this block of sensation, they tell us and this is my favourite quote from the, I think of all time, the plane of material ascends irresistibly and, and invades the plane of composition of the sensations themselves to the point of being part of them or being indiscernible for them. That's just a lovely quote. Here the underlying forces in the material create something intensely present which will allow new worlds to germinate. When this happens, we may live the image. The event of picturing, as Wood has told us, involves the entanglement of bodies, instruments and the world. I wish, I wish to return to the question of instruments and to the instrument of, photo to, to the to the instrument of the camera shortly. But firstly I wish to address the entanglement of bodies and the world in order to go beyond the figure to the abstract framework and give an account as to how this may hold it together and us with it. And here I wish to evoke the event of Johann in Itten's. Oops, I'll just stay there for a minute. Sorry. So here I wish to evoke the event of Johann Itten's basic course on design and form. The basic course was, for a short time between 1919 and 1923, the foundation course of all Bauhaus students modelling his, his teaching program on that of his teacher, Adolf Holzel. 
he developed a program of instruction that was dedicated to exploring the means of design. And a lot of you in here probably have done something akin to, um, the, to it and design and form. So um, he developed, uh, his program of instruction was dedicated to exploring the means of design through the study of pictorial composition and the fundamentals of colour. In this course, Itten built, drew on Holzel's means of design, what we have become to know as the fundamentals of design, light, dark, colour, material and text, form, rhythm, expressive form, subjective forms, to construct the curriculum for this basic design course. Itten's teachings have been passed down to us in codified form as design fundamentals where form is considered as the manipulation of various visual elements and principles of design. Here, I think, what's happened in that kind of history is that the principles that, you know, when you start to evoke principles, you start to talk almost about the kind of notions of universals. And so in that sense, as they've come down through to us, they've come to assume the status of universals, principles to be applied and manipulated by artists. Thus, in, in David Lowe and Stephen Pentak's design principles, quote, content is what artists want to say and form is how they say it. This may seem, be seen to equate with the technical composition rather than the aesthetic composition that Deleuze and Guattari speak of. We have no sense of the entanglement in this between the material condition of the artwork and the sensations as we come about because they're sort of almost like uh, platonic ideal forms rather than actually embodied and connected. So here pictorial composition is reduced to the internal logic of the relationship between form and content. This is what we've come to understand by the term formalism and, the for and forms the key principle that came to understand formalist art. The rise of formalist art is, in, uh, is for us, uh, um, certainly for me, is inseparable from the emergence of Clement Greenberg as both a writer and critic. Clement uh, Greenberg claimed that realistic or illusionistic art dissembles the medium. Realist art uses art to conceal art. Greenberg advocated that art call attention to art in order to bring out the essence of art. For him, each art form had to be paired back to its pure and unique qualities. But through Clement Greenberg's formalism, the figurative and the abstract became oppositional. And I think that's become a real problem that's lived with us through to the present day, that oppositionality between figure, uh, figuration and abstraction. Um, and, and in that, abstract became the privileged term for Greenberg particularly. But is this how it conceived of his program or taught the means to design? And how horrified he might be see, to see that what, how de, what deserve, principles of design have come, come through to us. He did not see the figurative and abstract as oppositional, separate, but rather entwined in each other. Through his teaching, he was always asking students to go beyond the figure in order to understand the abstract framework that holds it together and with us, us with it. And so it was very interesting as part of his work, if you saw that he would actually get students to take uh, canonical works and actually then understand what is the fundamentals of, uh, of uh, rhythm and repetition and structure and form underneath it. So he was always looking for the, what lay underneath the appearances. Now, Eaton's teaching methods were rather un unorthodox at the time and probably still are quite unorthodox today. What he did was he aimed to prepare the body and the mind for work through the use of relaxation, balancing and harmonising exercise. He considered this essential in preparation for the task of picturing. For Eaton, experience and tacit knowing became the touchstones that prepared the artist for making pictorial compositions. Thus he believed that, and I quote, the character of materials had to be experienced and represented, not only seen but felt. I always attach great value to the sensual grasping of the characteristic of all things. Through building the world, 
into the, through building the world into body so that it became tacit. Itten's teaching made a direct connection between the world's textures and rhythms, body rhythms and its manifestation in and through the work. He saw the preparation of the mind and body as a critical phase in the process of creative work. So in the morning everybody got out and they did all of these kind of exercises to kind of prepare the body for the making of the work. So he saw the preparation of the mind-body as a critical phase in the creative process. When, for example, he introduced the, rhythm, the principle of rhythm in class, he took through students through the experience of the change in rhythms, and I want to quote from him. First, and you can imagine a class, uh, the class full. Firstly, I had the students walk in march rhythm, beating time with their hands. The rigidity of this simplest rhythm was to take hold of the whole body. Then I counted off a triple rhythm, so that the stress fell first on the right foot and then on the left. Various changes followed, and sometimes two students would dance together to a syncopated rhythm of a record. Then these rhythms were drawn. The march rhythm was re represented by stressed and unstressed strokes, the triple rhythm by circular elements. Varying intonation determined mo motion. When a march or waltz rhythm was stopped after a few beats and continued in irregular intervals, the interruption of the rhythmic movement was felt almost painfully by everyone. And so from that doing, that embodiment going into work. Now these felt rhythms became inscribed in the work. Thus for Itten, the principle of design were not, principles of design were not abstract ideal principles, but were the forces that enabled life to get into the work and create something intensely present so that, we, that it may be lived, the image may be lived. Through his eclectic teaching methods, Itten sought to draw together an intimate and tacit knowledge of materials and embodied experience in and application of the means of design and strategies to open up the imaginative possibilities in the work of students. In Design and Form he comments, and I quote, we worked on geometric and rhythmic forms, problems of proportion and expressive pictorial compositions. The study of polar contrast, exercises for relaxation and concentration of students brought amazing <coughs> successes. Then he says, I recognise creative automatism as one of the most important factors in art. So, what did he mean by automism? And why was it so important to him as a way of freeing creativity? Now, for the photographers amongst us who are well read, automatism is certainly a term that has recently re-emerged in, in the lexicon of photo photography and also art criticism. And I think of the, journal uh, the 2012 edition of Journal of Critical Inquiry, which was devoted to agency and automatism, photography as art since the 60s, and certainly Rosalind Krauss's uh, two books, Perpetual in Inventory and Under Blue Cap, very much coming as something that's re-emerged in in very recently. However, is there any relation between the term as used by Itten and these contemporary elaborations of automatism? And that was something that really kind of became important to me. Now, Itten was teaching his design course at the Bauhaus between 1919 and 1923, at around the same time as André Breton and Philippe Soupon wrote The Magnetic, Field, Magnetic Fields, the first example of automatic literature. Now, his mentor, Alf, 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 sorry, Adolf Holsen, was committed to the value of automatism in the arts much before that, but, uh, but the excitement in, in the arts was, that was generated around automatism as a technique to release creative imagination really centred around André Breton and the rise of surrealism. Automatism adopted by the surrealists as a method par excellence to tap into the unconscious and escape the rigours of rationality and conventional thought. And these are all things that we're very, very familiar with in our field. Um, yeah, so an automatism adopted by the surrealism as a method par excellence to tap into the unconscious and escape the rigours of rationality and conventional thought drew on Freud in psychoanalytic, te psychoanal psychoanalytic techniques of free association, free association. 
In the first Surrealist Manifesto published in 1924, Breton defined pure psychic automatism as the method, quote, by which an attempt is made to express either verbally, in writing, or in any other manner, the true functioning of thought. The dictation of thought in the absence of all control by reason, excluding any aesthetic or moral preconceptions. Through the technique of automatism, Breton imagined that the oppositions between subject and objective could be broken down and that perception and representation could be instead thought of as, and I quote, products of, of the dissociation of a single original faculty. For Breton, the eidetic or aesthetic image opens up this realm. <coughs> the notion of psychic automatism that is central to the thinking and practices of surrealism seemed to operate in a different order to the concept of automatism that has become with, associated with photography, particularly through the work of philosopher and film theorist Stanley Cavell. While psychic automatism is concerned with a mechanism to a a allow psychic facility sorry, faculties to flourish, Cavell's conceptualization of automatism in photography and films appears at first glance to be concerned with technology and the idea that the camera is an automat. In Cavell's view, says Diamour Costello, automatism refers to, and I quote, the brute automatism of the camera itself. The fact that cameras are capable of producing an image of whatever they record without subjective mediation." Unquote. In, this spirit, in the spirit of this brute automatism, all artistic media could be seen to be automatisms. However, in an era of, era of media obsolescence, observes Cavell, these automatisms are being lost to modern artists. Thus, he says, there are no longer known structures which must be followed if one has to speak, followed if one is to speak and to be understood. And a quote, the medium is to be invented out of itself. In Under Blue Cat, and also in Perpetual Inventory, Rosalind Krauss draws on Cavell's ideas of automatism to develop her thesis that, in the face of po the post-medium condition, artists can or need to invent their own mediums. She argues that in, in the face of the exhaustion of traditional media, media-specific art forms, and the paradigm shift that has ushered in the post-medium condition, artists have sought new technique, technical supports from outside the conventional artistic media, often obsolete and outmoded commercial technologies and practices from mass media and mass culture. Through articulating the new technical supports invented by artists, and we think of Ed Rusch's use of automobile, bill, William Kentridge's drawings for projection, James Coleman's adaption of the slide tape, uh, etc. So you know she's a whole series of people who have, have taken these new media, these uh, invented their media out of uh, um, practices from mass media and mass culture. So through taking these new technical supports, Krauss argues that the artists had to discover the rules of their technical support, and out of these rules forge a new practice. She proposes that Cavell's notion of automatism accounts for the discovery of the rules, and I quote, the rules by which practitioners of a given discipline gain the freedom to improvise. For Krauss, linking the notion of automatism to technical support frees artist, artistic practice from the strictures of medium specificity and allows practice to be understood in terms of Cavell's automatism. <coughs> Now, Costello suggests that Krauss derives her understanding of artistic media as, and I quote, not simply as physical materials, but as the physical materials in certain characteristic applications from Cavell. That's what she th he, f he feels that she draws from Cavell. However, he takes issue with Krauss's interpretation of Cavell's automatism, arguing it is of a different order to Cavell's. Costello argues that while for Cavell automatism is about the brute or technicity of the camera, the fact that a camera can produce an unmediated image, and he gives the, the example, that, I mean, for Cartier-Bresson's visit of Cardinal Parcelli, 
he says that Krauss's automatism involves two kinds of automatism. Firstly, a quasi-automatic automatism, which he calls automatic, that is associated with the interaction between the technology and the artist. And secondly, a psychic automatism, or, as I quote, automatisms of the unconscious, which he calls autographic where unexpected connections, associations and solutions that arise in the work, uh, solutions arise in the working process. Costello claims that Krauss derives her two senses of automatism from Kentridge's descriptions of, of, the working, of his working process, where images are not pre-planned but emerge through the regime of drawing. So she, he, you know, he says that's where her notion of, of uh, or the autographic comes from. Now this may be immediately true, but the notion of automatisms of the unconscious relates, takes us back to surrealism and the notion of psychic automatism. This brings us back to the Itten and to the question raised earlier. Is there any relation between the term as used by Itten and these contemporary elaborations of automatism? Between or in concert with Rosalind Krauss's conception of automatism as a form of psychic automatism and Cavell's conception of the brute automatism of the camera, does there exist an alternative frame that takes into account the dynamics of imaging that is revealed through Itten's mode of teaching? So I'm just trying to, to see whether that can kind of come in through that. Cavell sets this in motion when he poses a category of automatism. Uh, so it's interesting in Cavell's um, book, he has once one chapter that he deals specifically with the photography and th that kind of notion of the automat, uh, camera's automat. And then another one where he then relates it to painting and you have two different kind of notions of automatism sitting in the same, in, in the world view, which is, I find really interesting. So Cavell sets this thought in motion when he poses the category of automatism. In setting up the frame, he says that, that he needs to, at least at the outset, he said at least at the outset, and I quote, neutralise the presence of the physical mechanism of camera and projector and free the idea of the medium from its physical base. Since any consideration of automatism is both a historical and ontological question. This bracketing out allows Cavell to turn to modernist painting and to particularly to Jackson Pollock's embrace of automatism. It is part of the canon of art history and theory that Pollock's adoption of automatism was influenced by surrealism. However, drawing on Rubin, Cavell argues that Pollock, for Pollock it was not a method. It was not a method or technique of automatism that he borrowed. So it wasn't actually that that was borrowed. Rather, it was the idea of automatism. Thus, while the surrealists looked for, looked for automatism, for automatism which would create images, Pollock looked for an automatism with which to create paintings. Cavell claims that the automatism that Pollock invented was not action painting, rather through the evolution of an all over line that what was revealed as painting was its flatness in that it is totally there, in the sense that it is wholly open to you in front of your senses as no other form of art is. In other words, the conditions of possibility of pa modern painting did not require a recession into another world. The apparatus or technologies that were involved in the production of this new automism included the rhythms of Pollock's body, the idea of automism, the automatism of the paint and canvas, the discursive framing and reception of the paintings, and the historical, the sorry, histo the hist historical material practice of painting. So we start to see an assemblage that involves all of the discursive and non-discursive, the material and the non-material. If the automatisms of painting arise in the interplay between the material and the discursive, what are the automatisms of photography? Earlier I cited Costello who argued that for Cavell it was a brute automatism of the camera itself. In the world viewed, Cavell claims, and I quote, a painting is a world, a photograph is of the world. 
Now, before I proceed further, let me situate myself. I come to this lecture with a painter's sensibility, and this painter's unconscious may account for my hunch that through, through photography, we may actually become part of the teeming life of the work and not merely outside looking at the world. And I think that, that's uh, important for me. Is it the photographer's fate to be of the world and never be the world? Ben Woods has certainly aimed to make, at making his photo, photo drawings of the world presences that enact invisible forces. However, as we have seen, he has taken creative license with photography and as, as Hannah Hock before did in her photo montages, pieced together shapes to define planes, joined planes to bark out territory and activated a force field to create an aesthetic plane of composition and that's what both of them, them are, are doing. Um, but and and I, what I would say is that th this is the this is the work that the, the digital has has really allowed photography this whole idea of of the piecing together. Now, in taking photography as photography as such, Cavell seems to have, and I use the word seems to have, accepted the brute automatism of the camera, the fact of the camera's mechanism, the fact that its material opening. <coughs> Reality is an opening in a box that crops a slice of the world and brackets out the rest of the world. Is, for Cavell, the best emblem of the fact that a camera holding on an object is holding the rest of the world away. Thus he concludes that while the camera has been praised for extending the senses, he suggests that the praise should be more for confining the senses, leaving room for thought. But does photography necessarily confine the senses as Cavell would seem to have be arguing? Does the cropping of a slice of the world cut the rest of the world out? At first glance, we could say this is true of Olive Collins' drain pipes of 1937. Here the cropping does point to the world outside the frame, the pipes all lined up in a row, and the world beyond them tantalises for its absence. However, if we take our instructions from Eton, and I'm asking us to take our instructions from Eton, and go beyond the figure to the abstract framework that holds it together, we experience a, a sensation of pressure as shapes push and shove, rhythms march, and accents whip us around the picture. It used to be said, most certainly by my teachers, that the dynamism, dynamism keeps us in the picture frame. But here I would suggest that the dynamism, the dynamism of this photograph, the way that it's framed and composed, the dynamis dynamism actually builds us into the picture. And so I'm, not, I'm starting to say that that kind of creative, the way that a, a photographer actually builds and works with the camera, it actually builds us into us, rather than, as Cavell saying, keeps us looking at the world. The dynamism builds us into the picture. Olive Cotton's tea cup ballet does precisely that as we are caught up in the waltz and through the rhythms and repetitions and the force of vectors, we are deftly moved in and around the space. So that whole idea of those, those invisible forces and functions, which we have come to see as design principles, they are actually what builds us into the picture um, in it. So here I'm reminded uh, here I am reminded of a painting, Cirque Fernando, the Ringmaster by Toulouse-Lautrec of 1888, and how we are drawn into the world of the circus. Okay, so, so how we are actually drawn into, into the world of the circus. We come up through the Ringmaster, and through the line of his whip we are led up the horse's rump, and we become swept and catapulted around the circus ring, at fast speed. I mean, this is a really fast picture. You have slow pictures and we are caught slowly. We have fast, and this is an incredibly fast picture. As we are, we are whipped up the line of his whip and led up the horse's front and swept up and catapulted around the circus ring at fast speed, egged on by the repetitions of the black and white of the gentleman's suit and the red racy, the racy red of the rose of seating. We are moving so fast one could fear being cast out of the frame and dumped altogether. 
if it were not for the, the antics of the clown, whose cocky red hat catches us and draws us back down to the ringmaster, and once again we go on. So it enacts the kind of the, the it enacts the circus. Now, just to show you um, again, just to, to make my point clear, I'm just going to take out the little red man. And once we see this, so we again we are whipped up, we are whipped around, and we are whipped out of the space. We are, and, and, and so what I'm saying, we never just view with our eyes, we're always viewing with our bodies, uh, and that's the position that I come from. So, what I'm arguing that in, in terms of, of, of um, what I'm arguing in terms of both co uh, um, Olive Cotton's photographs and also here of Toulouse Lautrec, that they are not representations, but complexes of forces and vectors under representation, it's the complex forces and vectors under representation that produce the dynamism of the aesthetic image. And whilst we're just seeing a representation, we actually deny ourselves the possibility of being caught up and swept away. Now let us return to, to photography. Um, and, in, and this time to Henry Cartier-Bresson's The Visit of Cardinal Pacelli. Here we see Henri Cartier-Bresson he, when we view uh, Henri Cartier Bresson's visit of Cardinal Pacelli, we may, as Caroline Ar Carol Armstrong has done, start with Bart's photographic message and go on to marvel, and I quote, without any intervention of the photographer's agency, save for the quick gesture of raising the hand and clicking the shutter, the camera automatically generated the content that we have come to accept as Henri Carton's Carton Bresson's phot photograph. Excuse me, just getting a bit dry. This is, of course, true. We can do that. But in addition to this, when confronted with a photograph, we are brought close up through the generosity of the camera's viewpoint. What we experience is a tight spiralling inward through the repetition of heads that creates an intensity at the point of what Armstrong calls the scene of the kiss of Judas. So yes, we can see it in terms of, of the message, but if we start just to see it as rhythms and repetitions and shape, we are actually spiralling and it comes to that particular vortex. But what is the camera's role in all of this? And I promised earlier I would bring us back to the camera. Armstrong calls her article Automatism and Agency Intertwined and tells us that, apparently, Cartier-Bresson held the camera high over his head and had no conception of what would be in the frame. Yet in her attribution of agency to Cartier-Bresson, and that's what our history has done, that's where it, attribution comes, in her attribution of Cartier-Bresson, she seems to be suggesting that it is only the human has, who has agency in this, in this process. The automatism of the camera is just that, the brute mechanics of the camera. The fact that cameras are able to produce an image without subjective intervention. And the question of chance. Armstrong says of this photograph, and I quote, the photograph's resemblance to the scene of the kiss of Judas in the history of painting is merely fortuitous, a matter of pure luck. So too is the host of details around the head and the kissing of hands at the centre, the cardinal's skull cap, and its similarity to a yamoka, a woman's face between the two men, a partial profile above her, a Hitlerisk face, and the medal in the upper corner, a grimacing face. So she's just content, she has content, purely on content. You know, that, and that's what much photography examines, just purely on content, what's there, using the photographic uh, message. In his article, Agents, uh, sorry, in his article, Arts, Agents, Artifacts, Photography's Automatism, Patrick Maynard introduces the ambiguity between brute automatism and the notion of self-acting machine, of the self-acting machine. For Aristotle, he claims that the term automatum means self-action, or as he would have it, chance. He cites the 19th century art historian Lady Eslake, Aka Elizabeth Rigby, to support the view that self-action is about chance. Thus he says that Eastlake made, made, East mediate, 
meditated on, and I quote, the medium strikingly accident prone feature, I love that, the, the medium strikingly accident prone feature, its lack of power of selection and rejection, with emphasis on photography's propensity for unnecessary surface texture and detail, that is its noise, so this is the problem. However, aren't these propensities of the photograph what allows us to invent a new medium out of itself? This brings me back to Benjamin Wood and his accommodation, what he calls tactful participation in relation to the other participants engaged as part of his action improvisation. Here he sees that in practice tact is required so that one doesn't seize hold of or manipulate or process or possess, sorry, one doesn't seize hold of or manipulate or possess, and that he must be tactful, not only towards other people, but other forces, other actions and other matters that are others because they enact an entanglement of difference. In the constellation or articulation through which art emerges, there is, as Donna Haraway proposes, no ontological distinction between who makes and who is made in the relation between human and machine. In fact, it may be that through the intertwining of automatism and agency, the new, the new automatisms, the new automatisms as self-action, thinks itself a cyborg, or what Haraway calls the material semiotic actor. In the assemblage that constitutes the material semiotic actor, the actants may be human or non-human, machine or non-machine, discursive or material, symbolic or semiotic. What is critical to her position is that the material semiotic articulata becomes an apparatus of production, this notion of art, the, articulate, the articulata. Thus the apparatus or technologies that were involved in the production of this new automatism in Jackson Pollock's drip paintings included the rhythms of Pollock's body, the idea of automatism, the automatism of the paint and the canvas, the discursive framing and the reception of the painting and its historical material practice of painting. For Caval too, automatism in photography involves a complex articulation between the mechanical, the material and the discursive. It is not just a question of brute automatism of the camera. Conclusion. As I have encountered Wood's photo drawings from his action improvisations, return to the Bauhaus of the early 20th century to reconsider Itten's basic course on design and form. Step through Caval's explication of automatism and Krauss's adaptation of it in Under Blue Cap. I have sensed a more nuanced and complex understanding of the notion of automatism is emerging. This expanding sense of the term takes into account what Costello calls the autographic and the automatic, but in a materialist rather than in a modernist sense. For the autographic is not just the Provence, Provence not Provence, the province of the human actor, and the automatic is not just the domain of the me mechanical technology. Rather, through this articulation of the material and the discursive automat, we may, we, we may move beyond representationalism so that an image too may be allowed to be an intense reality and that we <coughs> may join it and live with it. Thank you. Can you say that just a little bit? Go a little bit again. So. I was just um, curious. Yeah. The word picturing. Yeah, rather than imaging. In relation say. to automism. Yes. That there a wasn't a relation. There was a relation. Or b 
that if there wasn't a relation, then it seems to me that you're trying to bring something to the to the field of photography or to the moment of photography that both puts one step in this uh, this sort of unconscious thing that, that that breaks apart the technology, but on the other hand, bringing in painting, literally bringing it in by talking about picturing as opposed to visualization or the usual ways people mm -hmm. talk about the photo or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, I mean it comes back to the, the, this idea of an articulator and articulation yeah. that that um, that I mean I am a painter so my my and I, and and to Heidegger too um, this idea of co-responsibility and indebtedness mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean I, I I am indebted to Heidegger for allowing me to understand this so that picturing when, when you talk about an image I mean it's so Fraught, deeply fraught, the, the kind of historical understandings of of an image, and and the pic, even pick the, the kind of the, the term itself. Pick the, it, it, it's a, a volatile t term, and I think so. The kind of this indebtedness to um, the matter, the, the the latency that Daniel talks about uh, in a photograph through. Um, Yes, there is the, the unconscious elements can a part of it, the the material, the touch, the movement, the the history. So there are all of these things picked together, and I suppose we could talk about the pixel in that sense. But you know, start to pick together, and so the use of picturing rather than than mm -hmm. imaging is a very specific one to try and shift us into a new relation, um, and and uh, an active relation of making. One more question, because then, but sadly, we are on a paper. Could you just say your name as well? John Lecty. Thank Thanks, you. John. John. Just have one question about the relationship between the automatism of photography and the yeah. camera that you mentioned. Could one suggest that perhaps the, the the camera actually disappears in relation to automatism? It doesn't mm -hmm. emerge. It becomes invisible in its own. It's an analytic truth that you're presenting to us rather than a, a visual truth or mm. an exper experiential truth. Mm. Could you just, uh, for example, with the Breton Supo and the mm. automatic writing, they, it, it was, they wanted to bypass all the, the mediation or. Yes, aspects. yeah, yeah, no, that's a nice way of. Yes, I think that, that would be, I would accept that, that would be true. I haven't quite. Got that, but yes, I think in terms of automatism and surrealism, that would make sense. Well, once you get rid of the camera, then I'm not saying that in an actual sense, but you then provide the the the, the, the scope for the image to emerge as such. Mm. That'd be my thesis. Okay, I accept that. <laughs> yes. Good. Well, thank you very much. Let's have some coffee and then come back in for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you.